This is Leanne Hicks, Seminar and Event Coordinator with the Michigan Manufacturers Association. Welcome to our webinar presented by Dewar Sloan, Connecting Strategic Planning with Everyday Operations. Questions are encouraged. We please um, urge you to utilize the questions section to type them in. Our speaker today is Daniel Wolf, President and CEO of Dewar Sloan. His group provides advice and counsel on strategy and governance for corporate and middle market organizations. He is the author of two books and numerous articles on strategy for business growth, performance, and change. His manufacturing experience reflects many different industries and conditions for business evolution. We extend a special thanks to Dewar Sloan for presenting today, and now let's begin. Thank you, uh, Leanne. And uh, if I can switch over, there we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to share a few ideas about strategic planning in the context of the everyday operations of manufacturing companies. I've been at this for a while, first in my corporate life in uh, healthcare, in recreational durables, vehicles, and industrial products. And for the last 20 or 25 years in my consulting life is I have tried to uh, put these things to work in a, in a variety of different environments, both domestically and internationally. The thoughts I'm going to share today are, uh, are geared around uh, a contemporary model of strategic planning, if you will. It's one that encourages uh, strategy as a mindset and strategy as a cultural discipline of companies, not just a mechanical discipline of senior management. I will address this at different points uh, uh, of view, one from a board point of view, one from a corporate and executive point of view, but most of the time we're going to be focused on the people that make strategy happen in the heart and soul of the organization. And those are people uh, in, in shop operations, in production planning, in technology, and in the revenue and, uh, and operating streams of companies. The making strategy happen piece of this for me is very, very personal. I think people make strategy happen. I don't think plans make strategy happen. And so as we go through this, I'm going to emphasize uh, the role of individuals at each respective level of the organization, their influence and their thumbprint on strategy. Uh, we think very much that uh, strategy is less about plans and more about everyday thought and behavior. And that means that we need strategic thinkers at several different levels of the organization, particularly in firms that have to manage supply and demand dynamics in a manufacturing environment. When we say focused on business results, we mean just that. Most companies exist to create value. Business results uh, tend to be formed and, and forged and defined in the language of economic value and in the language of strategic value. I will define those as we go along. But I think it's pretty obvious that uh, most companies seek a level of growth and performance of change, and they direct and define their results accordingly. So that kind of sets the stage for how we will approach uh, connecting strategic planning with everyday operations. Mm -hmm. The meaning of strategy is quite varied from company to company. Uh, there are literally thousands of books that uh, attempt to define what strategy is, what strategic planning means, where strategy flows in the, in the heart and soul of organizations. And when we take all of that literature together and we take all the best practices together, we have four uh, general definitions of what strategy means. Uh, first of all, it means direction. It's a directional guide that helps employees in the broader organization understand what they stand for and where they're headed. So when you, when you think of companies defining their mission and purpose and vision statements and taking that all the way through to their highest strategic priorities or objectives or goals, uh, that's direction. Direction is here's where we are, here's where we're headed, here is our near-term and long-term prospect for growing and performing. Another important definition of strategy pivots off this notion of procedure, uh, strategy as a procedural guide. Uh, this is a little more dynamic than direction per se, but a procedural guide helps uh, explain to the organization what we intend uh, to become and how we will approach things. Um, this is more process-oriented. It's important to have process, of course. 
but it, uh, it takes a departure from direction and it says our intentions near term and long term are to actually get someplace. It's not just about what we stand for, but it's how we're going to get there. A third definition relates to performance itself, what we expect and how we work together to get things done. And this is where most of us see a lot of conversation about measures and metrics and key performance indicators. Uh, all of those are part of the performance guide definition of strategy. And the fourth point here, uh, the development guide, how we grow competence and options. Competence can be the competence of people, the competence of, a, of our capacity, uh, maturity within an organization, or competence of technology. Options have to do with our strategic roadmap. A company is generally more flexible when it has more options. When it makes hard strategic choices, it limits those options by definition. In all of this, uh, I, I think it's really important to, uh, to understand and bring to the fore that if strategy is relevant to people, they will act upon it, they will think about it, they will behave accordingly. If it's irrelevant to people, and it can be in many organizations, they will not respond. So this makes, uh, this makes the beginning of our human case for strategy. Strategy is uh, not independent of the marketplace and the organization. Uh, the marketplace, I think all of us would agree, is uh, probably as dynamic as it's been uh, in, in the post-war era. And we can look at technical market and economic conditions and say, uh, yeah, this is moving. Uh, the auto industry moves, the printing industry moves, the machine industry moves, even the human resources industry moves. There is a term that has come out of uh, the Army War College and probably Aristotle himself that's called VUCA. Uh, many companies, uh, rightfully so, believe that they are operating in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. That kind of environment requires a different kind of attention, a different kind of anticipation that, than we may have needed in the past. On the organization front, uh, we have companies that are, are basically comprised of structures and cultures and resources. We put these structures and cultures and resources together to form some kind of capability to, complete, to compete in a marketplace. At the same time, the market is dynamic. The organization is also generally dynamic in terms of tensions, attention, responses, and evolution. And this is our short-term pair. Uh, the tensions in most organizations are pretty obvious. There are tensions between the demand side of the house and the supply side of the house. What's interesting in strategy, uh, I, I think, uh, among other things, is that some people really pay attention to these issues, and some people ignore them or hope that they just go away. Those two things, in turn, form the kind of responses and the kind of evolution a company can expect to take command of or control of. Um, I think the bottom line here of strategy having many moving parts is an understatement for most organizations. If we had a completely stable marketplace and environment and a completely mature organization, we would sound like the symphony orchestra from, uh, from a big city symphony. Uh, in reality, the market is dynamic, the organization is full of clatter, and it sounds more like the symphony orchestra of the seventh or eighth grade. We recognize the tune, but it's not pretty. The challenges that most operating companies, and I'm defining an operating company here, is that which actually makes something that makes uh, a product or a service from materials and labor and technology from the, uh, from the overdraft or overhead of a company. And companies exist, uh, especially at the operating level, to produce some level of economic value and some level of strategic value for those who invest, those who work at, those who consume from this company. Um, I think it's often invisible to the employees of manufacturing organizations that strategic value and economic value are why they come to work every day. This may seem more like executive talk or board talk or investment talk, but the reality is if we don't generate economic value from revenues and margin against some capital load, 
Uh, and if we don't generate some strategic value, some long-term capability and reputation and sustainability, then we're unlikely to, uh, to have long-term viability in any operating company. This notion of made to last, which uh, has been repeated many times since, uh, since Jim Collins kind of coined it uh, 15 years ago, is a tough journey because economic value and strategic value have to be put together and navigated in this dynamic marketplace environment and in our dynamic organizations. One of the big ideas, I think, in strategy today is that senior managers in particular have to be mindful of the operation of today, which is really a consistency game, production throughput game, production quality, uh, economics, safety, control of margins, et cetera, and the next normal, which is very likely to be different from the operation of today. So we have one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat in, in terms of managing our operation of today for consistency and productivity and throughput, and one foot in the next normal which is uncertain, it's volatile, it's complex and ambiguous, but more than that, it's where the creativity of business development lies. We don't want there to be a rift or a, or a divide between those two, but there is, and that is part of the tension of today's organization. One of the better practice or best practice patterns in strategy is the linkage of planning cycles. And we see this in small and medium-sized enterprises as well as very large enterprises where there is a cycle of strategic planning that is connected with a cycle of resource planning, largely talent resources, mechanical capital resources. That is connected with a cycle of budgeting, and that is connected with a cycle of operating through the course of the year. In the perfect world, uh, these four cycles, uh, and there may be more, but these are, these are the classic cycles that we see in strategy, are surrounded by ideas like readiness and competence. Readiness is really looking to the future and saying we need to anticipate different events or different realities, and we need to develop a competence to intercept those. The capacity and experience ideas are really about the maturity of the company in dealing with its customers, the technology, uh, it employs the products and services it competes with in making sure that our capacity and the experience that we provide in the marketplace continues to advance, does not stand still. Measures in performance are what they are. They are the, uh, they are the metrics by which we guide uh, our progress, not necessarily perfection, but our progress. And those combine ultimately with knowledge and evolution. We know more about our business at the end of the year than we do about the beginning of the year. And we evolve and we track and we, we build ourselves to be more capable in the future than we are uh, last year or the year before or any time in the past. When we combine these four cycles, we're really asking a lot of an organization. We're asking top management, middle management, and, and floor management to come into sync and say, you know, part of the year, let's grind through the strategy. Part of the year, let's grind through our resource planning cycles. Part of the year, let's work hard on budgets and make sense. But most of the year, let's make this happen at the operational level. How this happens from company to company is not as symmetrical as this, uh, as this chart on page five shows. But this is an approach that seems to work for small and medium-sized industries and larger manufacturers alike. Another area where we have challenges in strategy today is, uh, is in the, uh, the simple area of people and culture. Uh, as we've stated here, you know, you've got an engagement issue and you have a cultural uh, mindset issue, and I'd like to address those just briefly. Engagement is, is what happens when people are really committed, when they really put the effort in, when they are really accountable for the plan, for the strategy. It's more than attention. It's more than understanding. It's more than appreciation. Engagement is when somebody's in all the way. They're fully in it. They're in the habits of the organization as agents of its strategy. They become strategy. The cultural side of this is about mindset. And I, I think we find those with more positive attitudes about the actions and, and impact of their strategy come to work through thick and thin, they're more prepared, they adapt better, they respond better, they grow every day, and they persist. 
this matter of persistence is becoming a huge deal in challenged industries, and I think we've seen this in everything from aerospace and automotive to the pharmaceutical and chemistry industries alike. This idea that strategy is a basic construct for organization development is pretty big in our world because people make strategy happen. And I think at least one of the uh, one of the members of our conversation today, maybe Dr. Wallstrom, uh, would have, would agree on that. Um, all of this said, uh, people that are responsible for strategy, who draft strategy, uh, who enact strategy, who are responsible for strategy, have headaches with strategy. And some of the common concerns that we hear in organizations, large and small and in between, fall in these three areas. First of all, problems with direction. Not enough near-term and long-term balance. So when employees at the mid-management level say, we would know what to do if we knew where this company was headed, that's a problem with direction. And it's impossible to ask them to be responsible for what they're doing without saying, here's where we're headed. I put a 30% risk factor on problems with direction because our research, uh, both the empirical and the hard evidence research, suggests that uh, in large companies in particular, 70% have strategy direction that's clear enough uh, that they follow well enough that you could say they, they have direction down, 30% do not, or 30% have fatal flaws in that direction. I'm not going to use specific examples of companies because it's probably inappropriate for this webinar, but there are dozens of companies in our state that we've read about in the local media and we've seen in the national media, the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, Fast Company, every place else, that are evidence of this 30% risk factor. The second reset on strategy has to do with problems of integration or integrated in nature. Not enough communication, not enough adaptation, and not enough coordination. There's a 60% risk factor on this because easily more than half of companies we encounter, study, read about in the press, run into the chaos and the weeds and the swamp of strategy integration. More on this as we go along, but this is every company's problem. This 60% could easily be 90% if you took everything into account. Third, we have problems with execution. I think it's common for uh, for companies to say, we had a great strategy, but boy, this is really hard to execute. I would turn that on its nose and say, you know, if we have a great strategy, it's a strategy that we can execute. Let's figure out what we can execute, work backward to what we should be doing directionally and with regard to integration. Problems with execution on my list are only a 10% risk factor. And yet they seem, to, uh, they seem to entertain a significant amount of clutter in conversations we have with senior managers on strategy. I think what they're misplacing is a lot of problems with integration that aren't properly called as such. Just about everybody we see suffers from these concerns. They complain about them. People are slowed down by them. Good people leave companies because of them. Competitive share gains and share losses are functions of these things. Profitability is a function of these things. And near-term, long-term balance is a function of these things. As we look at an alternative to conventional strategic planning, we might say that contemporary strategy involves a lot more agenda and a lot less dictate. And by agenda, we mean uh, a, a balanced, ongoing conversation, an ongoing creative analysis, an ongoing attention of management and leadership to the essence of what strategy really is. And that is directional, it's integration, and it's about execution. More agenda and less dictate also means that we are not going to rely on a written plan put together by analytic assumptions that may be uh, less flexible and, uh, and less adaptive in a written form than they are in a behavioral form. So this is a more adaptive approach. It depends on connect, uh, key connectivities. It uh, depends on people working together in the context of owning this strategic agenda as opposed to pulling the strategic plan out and figuring out what they should do. And finally, uh, this means that people are 
the strategy operatives. They are part of the strategy. What they do, how they think, how they act, how they interact is the strategy itself. The decisions they make manifest the strategy. The options they hold reflect the strategy. How value is created and risks are absorbed is part of the strategy. I have this sandwiched in between a company environment which includes uh, the, the capabilities and the events of the marketplace and the nature of the organization. That's all company environment. And the natural goals of business. When we say natural goals of business, we really mean the four things that are reflected in almost every company's mission or purpose or vision statement. And those are, one, connecting with customers, two, economic performance or financial performance, three, competitive advantage or competitive differential advantage or competitive sustainability, and four, corporate stewardship. Corporate stewardship is a combination of the ethics and integrity and compliance and employee and supplier stewardship and partnership uh, to, uh, to keep the company moving. This idea of a strategic agenda is just more dynamic than most conventional linear strategy allows a company to be. Now there's a leadership and a management component in all of this. We ask our organizations to put forth the leadership and management resources that will help us connect the dots of strategy direction, strategy integration, and strategy execution. This is a short list of a very, uh, a very uh, long roster of things that we could say are essential in leadership and management. Uh, I'm inclined to think in, in the work of uh, strategists everywhere that we don't need more leaders and less managers or more managers and less leaders. I think we need quite a bit of both in each individual that is part of the organization. For short uh, course only, I've, uh, I've identified five areas of leadership, characteristics, if you will, traits, if you want, considerations, and, and development issues, if, if appropriate, and then five issues with management. And these five areas are, are more disciplinary in nature, more mechanical in nature. If we think of management as the, as the part of the is the overriding function of an organization that connects information and procedures, arranges things, provides framework, and does measurement. That's, you know, that's fairly classical management. The classical leadership elements uh, uh, would seem to us for strategy to be perspectives like foresight, insight, hindsight, the aspirations of the organization, what we really choose to lay out as our vision. Uh, the relationships we have amongst and between ourselves, even if there's politics and conflict and everything else. Engagement, which is that commitment and accountability thing again. And sustenance. Do we have leadership sustenance that goes from the boardroom to the, to the basement of our organizations? All together, in short form, for strategy, if this can drive some maturity, if it can drive experience and judgment and develop then we're engaging at every level. If strategy leadership and management engages at every level, we better equip our employees to be operatives of the strategic agenda. If these things are missing, they need to be developed. If we expect to be able to do good strategy without these things, we're not right. Let's take a look at these three specific elements of strategy, direction, integration, and execution separately. Strategy direction uh, is, is really about company focus and choices in this sense. We have a certain uh, focus and choice set with regard to growth, performance, and change. We need to put that on the table in management conversations, and then we need to communicate it and convey it to the balance of our organization so they can behave accordingly. We need to think through our focus and choices, not only the choices of our priorities and focus, but the choices of things that we're not going to do. Those send important messages to the employees of the organization. And when we fail to do this, an employee has, uh, has an opportunity to exhibit behaviors that say, I don't know where we're headed, so I don't know how to behave. And that's not going to be helpful long term. 
This is true at the executive vice president level in big companies, and it's true at the operating level of 30-man machine shops. The second element is strategy integration. And this is where uh, the platforms and systems of our company come together to help link processes and manage and balance resources and put the right capital on the ground to be successful and then to do the, the, the connection work it takes with our networks internally, that is function to function, process to process, and externally with our supply chain partners and our demand chain partners, our channel of distribution partners, our selling channel, our go-to-market partners, etc. These platforms give us operating advantage. These systems are the elements of our operation. These are, these are the strings in our orchestra that we use to do strategy integration. A lot of the competence or incompetence or capability or immaturity of a company can be linked to these four subjects, and these are what makes strategy hard. When people say, yeah, we have a strategy, but it's harder than it looks, when we could, you know, we could be talking about anything from automotive production to healthcare reform right now, and the chaos would be in these four areas. The chaos balanced by the know-how and the resolve is what we have in strategy integration. Our third area is strategy execution. And this is really where the action and impact of strategy come together. This is both mechanical in nature and behavioral in nature. What matters most, I've identified in these four areas, is projects, standards, programs, and sequence. These are the tools of everyday work. These are the tools for our, for our corporals and our privates on the front line to do the work of executing strategy. Standards and sequence provide ground rules. Projects and programs give frameworks. The whole thing is held together by checkpoints and metrics. Companies who have a lot of experience with uh, Lean and A3, for example, will recognize these things and they will say, we are, we are either really good, we have really high capability maturity in project management, or we don't. We have really strong and deep standards and uh, critical checkpoints, or we don't. Our work streams are formed or they're not. Our programs for development are really rich or they're empty and, and haphazard. And our sequence is either flowing or it's choppy. These are strategy execution things. And again, while they're harder than, than they look, these are mechanical enough that most people trained adequately can function well with strategy execution. The chaos of strategy integration is not the same kind of tension that we see in strategy execution. We have uh, in operating companies these stakeholders. Uh, these people put thumbprints on our operation every day. Uh, customers obviously pose demands on our organization. Suppliers are hopefully our partners. Investors hopefully give us capital and patience to, uh, to generate value for them. But at the end of the day, it's the employees that have to make strategy happen. They have to do this in an environment that could be pushing up against the interest of investors. It could be in conflict with suppliers. It could be up against the tension of customers. It's really management and leadership in the middle of these companies. This is, this is the mid-level influence strategy that brings these four perspectives, points of view, need sets, challenges, concerns, risks, and goals together. And when the stakeholders have a voice in the middle of an organization, employees are going to act more like strategic operatives. When we put employees and talent together with what we expect to be our competitive advantage, that's the magic of people making strategy happen. Talent, if we take the, uh, the conventional definition of, of uh, talent as competence and motivation and relationships, that's a key bridge. Advantage in terms of products and services, market focus, and operating resources, that's blue. And employees who, from top to bottom, get it and are engaged, that's the third piece of blue. So this is about habits at every level. This is not just at the top. It's not just in the middle. It's not just in the bottom. It's vertically, horizontally, and diagonally all the time, every day, as a habit. I think confidence is an important part of this equation. 
And uh, oftentimes we'll hear people in the middle ranks saying, you know, I just don't have confidence that we have clear enough direction. Or somebody on the top saying, I don't think we have confidence in our people to get this done. Or people on the front lines or the machine lines or the supply chain uh, depot lines saying, I'm not confident anybody around here knows what the hell they're doing. Those are problems in confidence that can be addressed if we really look at these five areas. Uh, how does competence and strategy mix with expertise, capacity, and maturity? Is that clear? Is it foggy? Can people deal with a certain amount of ambiguity? Do we trust each other? Most organizations have what I would call a crusty and cool level of trust. Some have a hot level of trust, meaning we could disagree and we can even be bad at each other but we really, really are going to work to each other and have a competent expectation of something coming out of our trust. In collaboration, this is a word that is thrown around like people actually do it. Uh, in our experience, this is very difficult to do because it involves people working together to get things done they can't do separately but don't necessarily want to do together. Uh, together, however, we're able, we're ready, we're effective if we have a sense of collaboration that's baked into culture resources, possibly incentives, possibly the leadership and management to, uh, to, to, to bring together not only the, uh, the objective piece of this, the communication piece, but also the, uh, the engagement piece. A fourth issue in confidence is accountability. That's a given. And a fifth issue is motivation. Who comes to work every day to develop, to earn, to build, to deal with confidence or the lack of confidence? Confident people aren't necessarily always happy people, but confident people are capable and able of engaging in their strategic agenda. No confidence, low engagement, big issue. When we look at the issue of stress testing and strategy, I think this is one of those areas that is, uh, is vastly under-practiced. If we think of strategy as being uh, about readiness and, persi and persistence uh, or preparedness and resolute uh, intent, uh, you've got to test the assumptions, test the appropriation, and test the accountability all the time. We have this dynamic set of marketplace conditions, and we have a dynamic set of organizational conditions. When those things change, and they do every day and every week and every month, are we changing our assumptions about them? Demand in the marketplace, do we test our assumptions routinely? Do we move those through our strategy, direction, integration, and execution thinking? Are our people in the middle, where strategy in the middle is practiced, aware of these assumptions, or are they in the dark? If they're aware of the changes in assumptions and the stress testing on assumptions, they will engage. If they are not aware, they are chopped liver, and they don't like that. Stress testing of appropriations is really the rebalancing and remixing on a regular basis priorities and resources. Appropriation is about priorities and resources. If priorities remain the same and resources remain the same, then everything's hunky-dory. If priorities change in response to the marketplace or our organizational capacity to respond to the marketplace, then perhaps our resources should change. If our resources are enriched somehow, perhaps we have a greater appetite or capacity for priorities. If we routinely stress test appropriations, we'll know the difference. Finally, routinely stress testing of accountability. Accountability is more than measures. It's measures of things that matter and count. When we look at, uh, when we look at lucky happenstances and oil prices against the plastics industry, or agricultural prices against fuel or other commodity prices in the marketplace, sometimes those change the accountability equation in companies. They change the risk for employees. They change the doability of the strategic agenda. If we don't re routinely stress both inputs and outputs in a company's income statement and balance sheet and operating statements, then we're not doing the company justice. Stress testing, in our view, is a monthly affair. Uh, we know at least one significant $100 billion plus company that has stress testing in their strategic agenda is where they place most of their energy. 
and we know of one SME organization of less than $10 million that does this monthly as a routine. It's part of the rhythm. It makes them think well and act well. A few thoughts on strategy and change, because I think this is, uh, this is something that, uh, that often can freeze an organization from making good decisions, and it can also enhance an organization's decision-making capabilities. When we talk about change, generally we're looking at level one, two, or three change. Change at the level one le at the level one point is about process and policy. Two is about business priorities, and three is about the enterprise model itself. Level one changes are are modest, but they can upset people. Uh, anytime you change practices and procedures, you uh, you, you mess with people's uh, everyday. Uh, habits and patterns, and they need to respond accordingly. In a perfect world, we'd have the people whose habits and patterns are impacted by these process and policy changes be the authors of them. Business priorities can change. Opportunities come and go. Risks come and go. Threats come and go. Business priorities, therefore, change. Uh, in, in companies that are locked into a static, linear strategic planning approach, a conventional militaristic planning approach, if those priorities stay there forever and ever, uh, chances are they're going to be out of sync with the reality of the marketplace. The bottom line here for me is a kind of code of change. If the strategy and the change factors in an organization are relevant to me as your employee, if I understand the intentions, if I have the capacity to behave accordingly, we're going to be good. If any part of that code of change does not exist, if it's irrelevant to me, or I don't understand the intention, or I haven't been taught, or I can't perceive the behaviors, you have no code of change. No change, probably weak strategy engagement. The closing comments I'd like to make uh, in this conversation, which has been one way until this point, uh, have to do with what it is to be prepared and resolved. We, we think this is kind of the, uh, the philosophy, philosophy of contemporary strategy. Uh, no operating company we know doesn't have challenges. So operating companies have to face down those challenges every day. And I don't mean ignore them. I mean come right into them and say, there's a challenge. Uh, some of these are big problem solving deals. Some of them require collaboration. Some of them require broad adaptation. Uh, and a few of them say, you need a new business model. If we're a bookstore 10 years ago, we need a new business model and we need one fast. If you're the newspaper business 10 years ago, same thing. If you're the aerospace business that depends heavily on military contracts today, something has to bend here because federal budgets are, are, are going to be too interesting to, uh, to be happy with. So when we get to this idea of strategic readiness, it's really three things in my view. It's anticipation, looking forward near term and long term. For some companies this includes a look out there at least a decade and then backing up. It's preparation and it's some paranoia. Uh, I personally like Andy Grove's theory of, uh, of, of strategy which says if you're not a little paranoid you're not humble enough to evolve in a technical industry. Uh, I don't mean paranoia in the mental disease sense, I mean paranoia in we need to think about our next business model all the time. Resolve is something different, and this is starting to creep into the education literature as well as the business literature. It is persistence and grit, and it's a lot of resilience. Things don't always go well. Things aren't always perfect. In fact, most of us would say things are never perfect. So what do you do? Well, you get yourself set for progress as the objective rather than perfection. Uh, perfection is the, is, the, uh, is the ultimate metric in very few sports on this earth. It's, uh, it, might be the, it might be the metric for orchestral music, but uh, the, the persistence and grit and plenty of resilience idea has to do with uh, a company that is navigating an uncertain marketplace environment and a challenging organization that needs to evolve in response to that environment. No resolve, low engagement. A little bit about the next normal compared to consistency. And I'm not suggesting that at any time in the last 50 years companies have had an easy, easy way to go. But 
when uh, we have industries where demand cycles are relatively stable over long periods of time, like they were in the automotive industry until late 2008, we have fairly predictable conditions and capacity pretty well matched to objectives. Now, there's more to the story there for some industries, but that, that holds. That's, that's the world of consistency. The tune-up in strategy in a world of consistency is more efficiency, more productivity, more labor content leverage, more material content leverage, more quality, more supply chain integration, et cetera, et cetera. The next normal for operating companies has a lot more dynamic environments, and it has a lot more on the line with regard to capacity to adapt and transform. We need to do both of these at the same time. We need to have one foot in the consistent operational strategy and one foot in the requirements for next normal, whatever that is. Somebody has to be paranoid enough and anticipative enough to look at that next normal and say, what happens in that next normal requires different machines, different labor, different technology, perhaps different financing of this business to be successful. Those are part of the roadmap. The roadmap is mixed. It's one foot in consistency and one foot in the next normal. Now, a gut check here on engagement, because I think engagement is one of these words we throw around out there like we know what it means. But in a strategy sense, in a strategy sense, moving on this journey with a kind of strategy roadmap for a company, engagement is really these five things. Learning and discovery, commitment and accountability, talent and enthusiasm, good, serious, systemic, mature collaboration, and appreciation and a culture of respect. And those of you who have really studied lean know that when you go to the net, net, bottommost line of lean, it starts with a culture of respect. So this double check on engagement for me is the work of uh, everyday leadership, and it's also part of the journey, which is uh, uh, one that, that takes us out in uncharted territory with an organization that's constantly evolving with good management and good leadership. So that's my net net on taking strategic planning into everyday operations, connecting it with the thought and behavior of everyday people on the line as well as in management positions. I think we've tried to connect the dots of leadership and management with regard to strategy direction integration, and execution. If this were easy, everybody would be doing it. If it were perfect, everybody would get the perfect book and follow it accordingly. It's not easy. It's full of turmoil. It's got some tension with it. It's punctuated by politics. And for most, most companies, uh, it, is, it is, a, is a thing that if we could get progress, we would be accomplishing our objective. So with that, I, uh, I'd like to conclude and uh, maybe open it back to you, Leanne, for some questions and comments. Uh, on the last uh, page here is a little bit about us, and I believe this material will be available to you through the Michigan Manufacturers Association. The references that I offer, offer here are, are simply those we've put together uh, in recent years, including uh, one book, Prepared and Re Resolved and then some uh, research papers that have either been published in uh, international journals or have been uh, used in international conferences. So with that, back to you, uh, Leanne. Great. Thank you, Dan. Thanks very much for presenting. Um, questions uh, from the audience. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, most manufacturing companies have a strategic plan that covers broader objectives and challenges. Why the gap between strategy and performance? Would well, you like to address? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, there, there is a difference between uh, what some folks have called espoused strategy, in other words, espoused strategy meaning what we say our strategy is, and the decisions they make. And employees, competitors, customers, suppliers sometimes look at the decisions you make as the best indicators of your strategy rather than what you say your strategy is. So there's a remarkable amount of conflict there. I think there's also a gap between stated strategy and performance because uh, we don't often stand back and say, why are we doing this to begin with? 
and we're, we're doing it for at least three reasons. We have strategy to help get our forward plans together and, and know how to allocate our capital and, and manage our resources. We're also doing it to manage risk, both strategic risk, operating risk, and, and financial risk. And we're doing it to help guide good decisions. Uh, those decisions often have to do with priorities and resources, but they may have to do with the business model. They may have to do with how we compete. They may have to do with our, our value proposition. And I think the third reason why there is a, uh, where, where there can be, doesn't have to be, but can be a gap between stated strategy and performance is that a lot of companies uh, are dependent on static, linear kinds of planning. Uh, they start off at the beginning of the year, they invest a lot of time in saying, what's the picture of the universe and here's our four goals, and then everything cascades off that. Um, in a market that is really consistent from one year to the next or one horizon to the next, that kind of static linear planning probably works okay. Uh, most of the markets that, uh, that we address and we serve and we observe are more dynamic than that, and they require a more capable organization that can operate in, uh, in an ambiguous environment with more dynamic plans. We do have another question, Dan. Um, this one is, I really appreciate the systemic and systematic view of how you approach strategy. On a related note, can you please provide some detail or examples on what you call stress testing? Sure. Sure. Uh, is the screen still up or uh, go back to uh, my slide 15? Uh, stress testing or pressure testing, uh, you know, takes, takes form in a couple of different ways by my experience. Uh, one form it takes place is, is where on a very disciplined basis management or the appropriate parts of the organization get together routinely, and I would suggest monthly or quarterly, uh, to, uh, to say, are our assumptions really, really solid, really, really sure, or are they kind of sure, are we starting to doubt ourselves, or do we need to change our assumptions? Uh, assumptions about market demand, assumptions about competition, assumptions about the viability of our products and services. Assumptions about our attainable margins, our supply chain margins, our contribution margins. Those assumptions are generally more fluid than uh, than our uh, than our financial friends would like to uh, admit when they give their forward projections. Stress testing of appropriations allows an organization to not necessarily second guess, but review the timing of appropriations review the depth of resources available for appropriations, review changes in priorities. For example, a company on its, on its way up with, uh, you know, having a good year or having a good two or three year run might say, well, let's, let's pour more coal into the boiler here and let's put more resources on the priorities we have and maybe we can get this thing to go even faster in terms of growth, performance, and change. On the other hand, a company that's a little constrained and facing headwinds in the marketplace and determining that, you know, we had five priorities, we can really only fund three of these adequately or we're going we're gonna to slap ourselves uh, with in inadequate funding across too big a spread of objectives. That stress testing of appropriations may cause them to contract and focus and concentrate more on the things that are going to be most important to the success of the business. Stress testing of accountability. Um, Often this is left to uh, key performance indicator people and financial people, but I think the challenge here is to look at accountability for effort and impact. Also to look at accountability for things that we can truly control versus those we're just lucky enough or unlucky enough to be in the path of. And then finally, accountability for making decisions on point, on time, in the right context, under the right conditions. Uh, this stress testing, I, I think you could stand back and say, is any of this not just a definition for good leadership and management, but forced into a, a strategic context by saying, we got to do this every month, or we have to do this every quarter to keep ourselves on track, to keep ourselves honest, and to keep ourselves credible in the organization. Thank you very much for presenting today's webinar. 
Thank you, everyone, for connecting in with uh, MMA's webinar today. We look forward to you doing so in the future. Uh, we encourage you to connect with the speaker. If you have any questions, MMA will be posting this information on the website along with the PDF of the slides and possibly on YouTube as well. So feel free to share this information with your colleagues. Um, again, I look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you and have a great day.